I'm not a country singer. I'm a pivoter. That's what I do. In the game of basketball, to move around the court, you have to bounce or dribble the ball. But once you pick it up, you got to stop. But you still have one special move. Anyone here a fan of the Raptors? You know what I'm... Oh, okay. All right. Well, then you would know that that move is called the pivot. And as you pivot, you can check new angles. You can pass or you can shoot. Well, in basketball and in life, trouble is guaranteed. Disruption is inevitable. The pivot is a key tool for would-be game changers. You are here. You want to go there. But what to do when life circumstances evolve? Change is challenging. It can be tough to prepare for. It just is what it is. The game has changed, and now you got a deal. What are you going to do? Just stand there? Indecision is not an option. The pivot ignores what seems impossible and asks the question, while circumstances are not ideal, what can I do in the meantime? The pivot actively and positively looks for new and better options. But it takes faith, hope, perseverance. Well, it takes grit. Well, the pivot can be a surprisingly aggressive tactic. When I was 16 years old in high school, clearly skinnier, I, um, I was passionate about basketball, and I, I remember one high school tournament, we were outsized and outmatched. We'd been outscored by 80 points by the time the guy I was guarding picked up the ball from his dribble. Now, basketball wisdom would say to put pressure on your opponent, but not to stand too close because he still has his pivot. He can step around you and pass or shoot, and technically, he can pivot right through you. Well, my opponent knew the art of the pivot well. He sized me up, made eye contact, and he grinned. And he pivoted, and his elbow violently smashed into my lower jaw, and the next thing I knew, I'm waking up on the floor in a pool of my own blood in need of five stitches to hold together my lower lip. And then I was assessed the penalty. <laughs> the power of the pivot prevailed, and we lost the game miserably. Uh, high school continued, and reality set in. I realized that a pro basketball career was not in my future. But the power of the pivot... Well, that left a lasting impression. Today, I want to talk to you about some of life's pivots. And one of them is the stand my ground pivot, and the other is the what have I got to lose pivot. I attended Calgary's Mount Royal, now Mount Royal University. I was uh, 21 years old in 1994 and a recent graduate uh, of the nursing program. I was a registered nurse and worked as my first job in a hospital at the Alberta Children's Hospital. And I just loved my job there. Just a wonderful place. And I... You know, there's something about the innocent and trusting nature of a child that just makes you want to do good by them. You know, when a kid finds himself in a bind often through no fault of his own, there's something about being able to stand up for him and help him to have a full and healthy life. Now, on my days off, there was a little boy, seven years old, he'd been playing football with his buddies and he got it stuck up on the roof of a house and his buddies sent him up there to get it. You can guess what happened next. He fell off the roof broke his arm badly, was rushed to the hospital and into surgery. And I came on to shift a couple of days later, and he was cleared to go home. So I walked into his room, and he was sitting there watching cartoons all by himself. And I said, hey, Billy, my name's Paul. I'll be taking care of you today. I'm going to get you to wiggle your fingers for me. That's great. That's good. Your arm's getting better. We're going to get rid of your IV, and it doesn't hurt a bit. And then we'll pack up your stuff, and you get to go home with mommy and daddy. How does that sound? Well, Billy was nervous. His eyes were really wide, and he looks at me. He goes, well, you know what you're doing, right? Because you're the doctor. <laughs> and I say, well, actually, Billy, I'm, I'm not your doctor. I'm your nurse. And his eyes got even wider, and he says, you're a girl? <laughs> Children have an amazing ability to trust and believe. And Billy believed that because I was an adult, I would know what to do. He trusted I would do the right thing even if I was the ugliest girl he'd ever seen. <laughs> my healthcare career continued. I was living at home, mooching off my parents, and I came home from work one day. I, I'd had this hobby that was developing into a passion for singing and writing songs and playing guitar and entering talent competitions. And I come home and Dad's sitting on the couch and he's got this excited look on his face and he's pointing at the phone. He's like, there's a message for you. So I went over and picked it up and I hit the button and I heard something like this. Hey, my name's Paige Levy. I'm with Warner Reprise Nashville. 
I signed D. White Yoakum to the record label, and I heard your demo. I think you're real good. <laughs> I want to come up to Calgary and hear you and your band play. Give me a call. Completely unexpected. The game had changed. I picked up the ball. I grabbed the phone. I hit the button, called her up, said, yeah, come on up and hear me and my band play. And she agreed, and I hung up the phone, and then I picked up the phone again and called a buddy. I'm like, dude, you have to help me put a band together. I... <laughs> I didn't have a band. I was, I was playing in coffee shops and in my basement for friends and for family. I always like to call this the what have I got to lose pivot. Because I figured, you know, they'd fly me to Nashville, and worst case, they'd put a sticky note on my back that said, wrong cowboy, send someone different. And they'd fly me home, and I'd be back in Calgary. I mean, why not? Pivot foot planted firmly on the ground. I squared up to the basket, took the long shot at Nashville, and it went in. Whew. Nothing but net. Not long after, I signed a seven-album record deal, and my music career had begun. Uh, <laughs> it, it took off like a rocket. 180 shows a year, top five single, number one single, gold record, platinum record, million records sold around the world. It seemed like nothing could stop it. And then, cassettes to CDs to MP3s to streaming, the music industry was the canary in the coal mine for the digital era. We all watched as it went from $20 billion to $2 billion a year in revenue. It's recovered some, but we're still reeling. I remember asking the head of the label at the time what his digital strategy was, and he said, and I quote, the MP3 is a passing fad. <laughs> it's like the CB radio. It'll be here today and gone tomorrow. You mark my words. I kind of think he should have pivoted. Tensions boiled over in a label boardroom meeting as executives discussed my upcoming second album and what I would say and what I would do and what I would wear and one particular song they wanted me to sing. It was a well-written song, had a great chance of being in a, a, a hit and I, you know, I, I just didn't want to sing it. I, I didn't like the message. It didn't match my artistry. So I, I pushed back a bit and said, I'm, I'm not going to sing that song. And the room went silent. And someone said, well, you're an actor, that's your job, that's what we're paying you for, you're going to sing it. I stood my ground and said, no, I'm not going to sing that song. And then someone asked a question that changed the game for me again. It stopped me dead in my tracks. I said, well, what's more important, Paul, what you believe or your career? Or in other words, there are a million kids standing right behind you who would kill to be in your position, and if you don't do it, we'll just give it to one of them, and then where will you be? Tough pivot for a 25-year-old with big dreams of conquering the international music industry. What was more important to me? I had a decision to make. I assessed my options, assured the label I would live up to my word, but suggested perhaps we were moving in two opposite directions, and it would be better for both of us if they would just let me go. They said no. I was contractually obligated, and I continued to deliver new music. It wasn't until two albums later I finally got the phone call that released me from that deal. I've never felt more free and empowered and terrified all at the same time. The stand my ground pivot is the toughest pivot to make. It's possible to pivot and still not see any way out. In these circumstances, I would encourage you to consider the source of your strength. What is it that keeps you in the game? Is it self-determination? Is it money? Is it competition? Is it science? Is it God? The source of your strength, trustworthy? Is it dependable? How's it working out for you? It's easy to lose heart. When I consider my country music woes at the time and compare them to the sometimes life and death situations that my patients were facing in the hospital, it seems kind of silly to me now when I was so scared about everything. It's like, look out, y'all, it's a country music emergency. Sound the alarm. <laughs> But in the moment, it felt as though I'd thrown my whole life away by leaving the label. I believe that the pivot based on principles is always worth it. Even if you lose the ball for a little bit. Even if it costs you the game. Stand your ground. Be authentic. Maybe you'll go on to play a different game. Maybe you learn to play the game you're in a little differently. 
with a teachable spirit, hard work, playing your own game always pays off, always. When I didn't know what to do, which way to go, I, I reimagined my definition of success. I clarified the roots of my identity. It was a very spiritual time. Okay, let's be real. Basically, I freaked out. <laughs> but, but then, well, the stand my ground pivot revealed unimaginable horizons. With more time on my hands, more flexibility, I started to see new solutions and opportunities come my way. And one of them was to travel internationally with various humanitarian organizations. We visited some of the poorest nations on the planet. One of those countries was Cambodia in Southeast Asia. It was there I was first exposed to the dark world of human trafficking. Now, most goodwilled folks would never imagine that the sale of people is one of the largest industries in the world today. Globally, human trafficking is the second largest source of illegal income. I was with a group of people that visited an area where the youngest of children were being bought and sold. It was horrific, heartbreaking. We visited a site where a California-based businessman saw a business opportunity and was constructing a three-story building to be used as a sex destination hotel to accommodate busloads and plane loads of men from around the world to sexually exploit young children. I met a little girl that day who was five years old. She was being sold six to eight times a night. And I thought about my daughter. What would I tell her that I did when I found out about this? And I thought about my son. What would I teach him about how to respect and interact with women? And I thought about little Billy at the hospital. Well, you know what you're doing, right? Because you're the doctor. Well, you're an adult, so I can trust you to do the right thing, can't I? How do you pivot around this? When that California-based businessman saw our small group standing up to him, well, he got nervous. He decided to move on, but first, he put the building on the market. So we bought it. We turned it into a church and a health clinic and a school with a renewed purpose to educate young Cambodian minds who would someday affect change for their nation and lead it to a brighter future. Now, <laughs> whenever I tell this story, one of two things happens. Either I never hear from the person again, or I get a call or a text. A couple days later, the message is always the same. How can I help? But the truth is, human trafficking is one of the fastest growing crimes in Canada today. The youngest victim I've met here in Alberta, seven. And she's Canadian, as are 93% of trafficking victims in Canada. But don't give up. Don't lose hope. We still have options. Maybe you're not a country music singer. Maybe you're a basketball playing country music singing, registered nurse who fights human trafficking. <laughs> okay, maybe not. Uh, but maybe you're just you. And what you do isn't who you are at all. What does your pivot look like? As a result of all these stories and in response to an elbow to the face, a case of mistaken gender identity accusation by a seven-year-old kid, a short nursing career, a failed record deal, making friends and contacts along the way, and leveraging a 25-year career in the ultra-competitive and ever-changing country music industry. An anti-human trafficking movement has begun. Not In My City is a facilitative organization that seeks to end human trafficking with a focus on childhood sexual exploitation. I hope you'll take the time to learn more at notinmycity.ca. Look, we all have different capacities to affect change, but with knowledge, comes responsibility. And in this situation, there are 20 to 30 million human trafficking victims in the world today, and they're counting on us. Indecision is not an option. But you can slow the game down. You can stand your ground, you can check your angles, you can pass or you can shoot, 
You might not see the solution right away, but one will always present itself. Even when you fail, you can come back tomorrow and try again. But come back tomorrow. Try again and again and again. Whatever challenges you're currently facing, you are here. Your next move will determine the course of the game for you and for those around you. Now is your time to dig deep, stand strong, and pivot.